We're back with another installment of Reference Points. So I'm here with Eric Wind, uh, the founder and proprietor of Wind Vintage, a longtime Houdinki contributor and, and watch expert. It's an honor to be here with you, Stephen. Thanks for coming. Um, you know, Reference Points is where we walk through the most important watches in history and kind of break them down watch by watch and explore what makes each piece unique and collectible. Can you maybe talk a little bit about the significance of the Submariner and why these watches are so important? So the Submariner was one of the first dive watches ever sort of purpose built for diving. For me, it's the platonic ideal of a watch. In the world of vintage Submariners, we can break things down into roughly sort of four eras, right? We've got the No Crown Guards era, which is, you know, ranges from the 6204 to the 5508, and all of those have cases with no crown guards. Then we have the 5512, which is the chronometer crown guard Submariner, right? Except the very earliest version. Okay. Yeah. Great. And then we have the 5513, which are the non-chronometer crown guard exactly. Submariners. And then we have the 1680s, which are chronometer certified and have a date. It's kind of an interesting thing that when people think of the Submariner, they often don't know the first reference that's recognized by the collector community is the 6204. This has hands that are very different than the Mercedes Hour hand we see today. They call pencil hands. It has a rotating bezel, but without hash marks between the 12 o'clock and 3 o'clock positions. And the watch dial, however, shows the characteristics we see today, the triangle at 12 o'clock and the rectangles at three, six, and nine on a no date. So it all started here. This is the smallest crown ever on a Submariner. It's 5.3 millimeters. And this watch also said Submariner on it. So this was really the birth of the reference. And that watch is from 1953? 53, yeah. Okay. And then just a year later, we get the this, next watch we yeah, have here. Yeah, the 6205. This is the earliest version of 6205, also with the pencil hands. There's multiple variations within these references. This version does not say Submariner on the dial. Neither of these references have depth ratings. The bezel is the same as the predecessor version. And then you move on to another version of 6205. This is where you see the famous Mercedes hour hand. The hands on this one are very long, and this is much more of what we see today. And then the next watch we have here is kind of an outlier of sorts. This is an Explorer dial Submariner. Yeah, the 6200, what some people call the King Sub. And it's funny because that's the earliest Submariner reference, but we see it come to market later. We see the 369 dial, this is the first Submariner to have that. And you see the eight millimeter crown, which is of course what makes it most distinguishable. Big crown models are sort of referred to as James Bond Submariners. And having one with a small logo like this is, is much rarer than having one it's with a large rare, one. It's much rarer, yeah. Obviously, any in really good condition are extremely desirable, and that's the first small logo I've held. The next group of watches we have here are, I think, the watches that a lot of people would see and immediately say, okay, this is a Submariner. All the DNA is now there. Yep. And that's the 6536. Yep. The 6536 is also called the Small Crown Submariner. And this feels very similar to the earlier models, but it has a depth rating on the dial of 100 meters, no hash bezel. It also has that distinctive white seconds hand. Distinctive with a very large sort of lollipop. This version is a case production of third quarter 1957. Also no hash, but it has a red triangle. This is the very first Submariner with a red triangle bezel insert that we see. And then this is the last version. We see hash marks for the first time between zero and 15 minutes, also with the depth rating. And so we've got the small crown Submariners, but then we also have the big crown Submariners. So yep. this is the 6538. Yep, the 6538 is what a lot of people associate with vintage big crown subs. And you have two line and four line versions. So the four line has chronometer text on the dial. There's various versions and placements of it, sometimes above the depth rating and sometimes below. This is from the third quarter of 1957 as well with a famous red triangle insert, but no hash, very rare. And then you have two examples of slightly later two line big crowns. Just to show you the aging difference, this is tropical. 
and this is non-tropical, and they're just 30 serial numbers apart. We've got two references left. We've got the 5510 and we've got the 5508, kind of the last exactly. big crown and the last small crown. Exactly. The 5510, you begin to see some slight differences in the dial versus the 6538. And you see the hash mark bezel from a zero to 15 minutes red triangle. That's an unusual reference. And then 5508 had sort of a wide production swath. You see cases made in 58 all the way to cases made in 1962. So you see the differences here. This is the earlier version, 58, 59, with the red triangle. This is the last version with no red triangle from 62. It has an exclamation point dial that's supposed to indicate that there's less radiation coming from the watch. So with the end of the 5508, we kind of close the door on the first chapter in the Samariner, the, the no crown guards chapter. Then we get the 5512. The very earliest of the 5512s has what's called the square crown guard. It was a very distinctive, very industrial, purpose-built design, and there's very few known today. And a number of these were shaved down, what we've called eagle beaks today, where Rolex presumably took a square crown guard watch and shaved it so it was easier to grab the crown. And of course, Rolex didn't want to do that with every watch, so they switched to this pointed crown guard design. Very few 5512s with red triangle inserts. You get to the pointed crown guard and they keep that design for a few years. Once we go to pointed crown guards, yep. then we have the chapter ring, and then we make the jump. Yep, these are all four line dials. And these are also the micro nuances that we see during this time. This is called a neat font style, where all the printing is together in the same color. This is what you more commonly see, where the superlative chronometer officially certified text is a slightly different color because it was presumably added after. And then this is one of the last 5512s, which is what we call a maxi dial. The plots are larger. It's the last run of matte dials, and this is a maxi Mark III lollipop where you see the depth rating changes from the meters first to the feet first toward 1969, 1970. And so production of the 5513 started when? Yeah, the 5513 was introduced with the cases we see around 1962, and this is a very early one. It's got a chapter ring, which all of these watches have, where you see the full outer circle and all the dashes come off of it. This one's also an exclamation point. It's two lines of text, of course. You'll never see uh, 5513 with the uh, chronometer text. I'm throwing in some other versions that are uh, very interesting and very collectible, like the Explorer dial. This also has chapter rings, so it's the earliest version of Explorer dial 5513. And I think that the collector community has found nine versions of Explorer dial Submariners. Around this time, then Rolex changed dial configurations to what people call an open chapter ring, where the dashes go straight out to the edge of the dial. And the plots sort of get larger, so it's a little bit easier to see underwater or at night. This is a version that has an underline. We see versions with the exclamation point where there's a tiny circle under the six o'clock plot, so it looks like an exclamation point. Then you see this switch to underline. Those with underline are sort of recognized to not have any radiation Geiger reading today. And this is what people are talking about when they start talking about things being guilt, guilt underline, guilt exclamation point. Yeah, these, are these, exactly. these little variations. This is called a double Swiss dial. It's got Swiss in white and Swiss in a gilt gold color. These are two different versions. That has an underline below Submariner. This has it below Oyster Perpetual at the top. And then you kind of transition toward the end of the gilt dial Submariners. This is circa 65, early 66, open chapter ring, no underline. And then you see, this is one called the Bart Simpson, where the coronet sort of resembles Bart Simpson's head. That's one of the other things that people don't think about a lot is everything was being kind of hand lettered and the logo was being hand drawn yes. for each of these. So. Yeah. Not even the coronet and the Rolex letter mark exactly. are the same across these watches. Yeah. And then we move into the matte era. You've got meters first, like with the 5512, and then you move with time 
to the very last version, but I did want to put in a, what we call the mill sub in the right. community. The 5513, designed for the British Royal Navy, they adopted this gladiator hand and that minute hand, which was borrowed from Omega Seamasters. The bezel, they wanted to be fully graduated, so it has hash marks all the way around. And the spring bars are fixed, so it could really only be worn with what we call a NATO strap today. You know, these are obviously highly collectible. Again, minor differences in dial between the early 5513s and the 5517s. And then you get to the, the last versions of 5513. This is a maxi dial Mark III, nickname is the lollipop, like the 5512 lollipop, because the plots are quite large. And you see Submariner above the depth rating, and you see Feet First below. And then we have a watch here that looks almost like a modern watch, right? It's the very last range of 5513, what we call an L serial. It's got this glossy dial with uh, plots being surrounded by white gold. Much easier to produce this sort of dial because you have the plots all set and you just stick them on the dial. And this version of dial is what we see on the modern no date and date subs today. So one of the things people have probably noticed is up to this point, we haven't talked about a single watch with a date window. Yeah. These are all no date subs, yes, right? Yeah. We do have a couple of date subs here, so yep. let's get into those. So the yep. first sub with a date is the 1680, what exactly. everybody calls the red sub, right? Exactly. Again, like the earlier versions, the very earliest have meters first in the depth rating. Just to give you an example with what we call the red sub, this is a meters first version, and then you see it switch to a feet first version. And the 1680 was also made in 18 karat gold. Yep. These were the first gold Submariners. And this is a meters first version in gold with a black dial. And then later they introduced a blue dial version. And you see all kinds of little variations. Like this is on what we would call a president bracelet today. But for the Mexican market, we see these often on GMTs and subs. So right. it was original to the watch. And then kind of the sibling, I guess, maybe, or the cousin of the mill sub, we have a Comex sub. This is a 1680. There's various versions, a 5514 that was special for Comex with a helium escape valve on the side. And then you saw it with sea dwellers to follow. Typically, we see the Comex on the dial, and it was for the French diving company. Last, we've got a white sub. So instead of being in red, it's in white. And this was the watch that led to a transition into the 16800 with Sapphire Crystal and Quickset and then all the versions through today. I've got to say, sitting down at this table and seeing all these watches in one place is pretty crazy. You know, yeah. this is not something you see every day. It's sort of an Avengers Assemble <laughs> cast of Submariners here. That's a really today. good way to put it. <laughs> For an average person looking at this, they all look roughly the same, but for a collector looking at all the variations of these references, you never get an opportunity to see something like this, ever.